Welcome to the Natural Health Podcast, where we bring awareness of sustainable health in the business hustle space. The Natural Health Podcast is perfect for the high-performing business-minded individuals who want to work with their biochemistry to achieve success and optimal health. It's Friday, which means it's time for friends sharing facts about health, business, and overall success. In today's episode, we talk to nutritionist Glenda Britton. Glenda came came to be a holistic nutritionist as a result of her own lived experience and health challenges. Glenda specializes in nutrition and mental health and is a nutritionist at the Star Clinic for Mood and Anxiety Disorders in Toronto, where she lives with her husband. She's also a proud mum of five adult children. Some of Glenda's hobbies and interests include downhill skier, and she's been doing this since she was a baby. She loves to cook and entertain family and friends, but not much of that is happening at the moment, unfortunately. And she's also a science geek and history buff. Welcome to the Natural Health Podcast, Glenda. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. You are most welcome. So a science geek and history buff, what type of history are we into? Uh, like World War II, that kind of thing. And when I say a buff, it's not like I'm an expert. I just, I'm really interested in it. And when other people want to watch like soaps and that kind of thing, I, I want to watch things about, you know, the wars. And anyway, I'm just really interested in it and have had more time doing that through the pandemic as, you know, most people are watching Netflix all the time. That's what I'm watching. And, um, yeah, and then I the science that. thing. Yeah, the science thing just, be, you know, I had never taken a science course before. I went back to nutrition school. And ever since then, my eyes just wide open and very interested. So on, you, you, you found know, your like, love. On, yeah, yeah, I did. I did. I love that. Yeah, documentaries about history are so fascinating. I love it. I love it too. Every time yeah. someone puts on a movie, I'm like, oh, can we watch that documentary instead? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely love that. So, Glenda, in the intro I introduced you, you became a holistic nutritionist as a result of your own lived experience and health challenges. Mm. Are you able to give us a few turning points to what led you to where you are now? Yeah. A nutritionist, a yeah. holistic nutritionist? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, like I used to think I was pretty healthy. I normalized a lot of, you know, symptoms that, you know, I, I feel a lot of people do normalize, like the other moms I would see in the schoolyard and that kind of thing. We all had, you know, mess hormones and not sleeping well. And, um, you know, I was getting sick all the time with, you know, every flu and bug that was going around. And, but I just thought that was kind of normal. And then my... I, I had a baby when I was 40 and up with a heart condition. It was got pretty scary and I ended up on this medication. And so it was sort of like this not very stable being on top of more stress and on top of medication and all that. And then, you know, one day it got so bad. My, my health got so bad that I couldn't even walk. I had terrible candidiasis and parasites and it was just, you know, I was, you know, went from being not so great to just like a few years just going downhill. And I went to a couple over the next couple of years, I went to a couple of naturopaths and, you know, all these different doctors because they, the naturopaths, and I know you're a naturopath, but um, they weren't talking to me about food. They were just talking to me about supplements. And so I was on all the supplements and that kind of thing. And I did get a lot better, uh, a lot healthier than I, you know, I function, but just barely function. I was exhausted all the time, napping like 10, 15 minutes whenever I could kind of thing. Until one day I discovered food and it was really quite by accident. And luckily I didn't make matters worse because I really didn't have a clue what I was doing, but I really altered what I was eating. I just hit the kitchen and I was soaking and sprouting and, and doing all these like you know, making my own crackers and cheese and milks and everything. Nothing, did, I wouldn't eat anything in the store unless, you know, like I prepared it myself. And within 10 days, my energy started coming back. And six to eight months later, I was in school studying nutrition. And so it was, it was such a wide, it was such an eye opener for me. And I've just never looked back. And, you know, now I can, you know, we're going to be talking about food intolerances. So I guess I can share a bit more of my story as we go along. But generally speaking, it's not like I eat, I don't do that every day anymore. Um, it's not like I'm in the kitchen 100% of the time, like I was for that short period. But um, food is medicine it is incredibly powerful. And yeah. that's my goal now is to spread the word. Yeah, wow, what a story. 
and such a quick turnaround when you got into the kitchen and you decided yeah. to spend that time in there and actually heal yourself. That mm-hmm. was such a mm-hmm. and, and I think it helped that I w- was on the supplements. So like I was getting some help, but now I know like very much what we're going to be talking about um, today is very much related to what I did in that short time. And then, you know, continued working on, on going forward. And then once I graduated, um, I had the opportunity to work with some family members with, with some mental health um, concerns, things that they'd been suffering with for decades in some cases. And I saw an amazing turnaround there as well. And that became my passion because I know whenever someone's not well, of course, it does not only affect them, it affects other people around them. But when somebody's feeling mentally unstable or unwell, it affects so many people. And uh, I, I know that because I grew up with mental illness in my family. And um, so that's been my passion. I made, since then have been just studying again and again, more and more and again and again, different courses. And um, so now I consider myself a specialist in the field of mental health, and nutrition and mental health. And I'm at yeah. the Start Clinic for Movement Anxiety Disorders. So. That's so yeah. beautiful. And I love the fact that, you know, you can go back now and be like, now you know the science point of view of what you did mm-hmm. and why it helped and how it helped. And that's where your mind just blows and you're like, wow, I can't believe that's, that's what I did without even knowing the science backing, how biochemistry works, a limited amount and things like that and then now you look at it and you're like oh this is what happened yes exactly exactly yeah to put all the pieces together because everyone's different as well right it's it's complicated it's complex but uh, there are definitely some some tricks and tips and for people who stick around at the end there's some of those so Wonderful, wonderful. Great. So before we get into today's topic, which everyone's probably so excited about because food intolerances are a huge, huge topic here in Australia and I'm pretty sure in Canada and the US and so forth, all around the world to say the least. But I want to find out a little bit more about you. I wanted to find out, you know, what what, what success means to you because it means different to mm-hmm. a lot of people. It means different things mm-hmm. to, you know, 10 years ago to 15 years ago to now. So what does success look like for Glenda now? Well, it's a good question. Um, when, like I said, when I went back to school, I didn't go back to school to become a clinician. But once I learned what I learned, I just thought, well, everybody needs to know this. And I didn't know anything about any of this. And so I just assumed most people don't. And based on the way most people eat, then it's obvious that, that they don't understand the impact certain foods can have on our overall health. So my goal is really to spread the word, do this kind of thing. I've got a YouTube channel as well. And I've got, you know, the Facebook group and I'm not so great on social media, but I I scratch away at that. And I see clients one-to-one and I uh, do online programs and that kind of thing, really just to get the word out. That is my goal. Cause it's not just about our health either. It's about the health of the planet. We eat a certain way and we are in the impact that we have on the planet by doing that is really powerful. And we don't have any more time to be thinking about this. It's time to turn that corner and start feeding ourselves the way we should be fed, get away from all chronic illness and inflammation and all of this stuff and start healing the planet at the same time. Oh, wow. That's, that's so powerful. And when we move it away from ourselves and we put it into society and the whole earth, it just changes. Everything changes. It's like you, you want to put in more effort. You want to make a change because it's not just about yeah. you anymore. It's about, you know, right. us all together as, 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 yeah. as so cool. I love that. that that's absolutely beautiful. Never, you know, <laughs> that's beautiful. So let's talk about today's topic, right? It's not the food's fault, So why do you have food intolerances? I guess that is like just in itself. It's like a lot of us, we go blaming the food. We go, oh, it's this. It's Mm -hmm. not food making us feel like that. It's this. And and that in itself is, you know, destructive in some sense. But to start off, let's discuss intolerances. What does it mean to be intolerant to food? Okay. That's a good place to start because an intolerance is not the same thing as an allergy. 
right? So this is an anaphylactic. This isn't like if somebody needs an EpiPen for a nut allergy or a soya or a seafood allergy or something like that. This is not what we're talking about. Intolerance is more of a, it's, it's still an inflammatory response, but it's, um, it can, you know, it's, it's complicated and we're going to go into that as well. But uh, food intolerance is the symptoms can include actually a myriad of different things. Typically, we think of it as gas and bloating, and a digestive kind of upset, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that. It can a food intolerance can show up as a as anxiety or a, a, a poor mood or sleeplessness, aches. Um, excuse me. Um, lots of different things can be um, you know can look or can be symptoms of a food intolerance. So um, yeah, it's and it's something that. Um, happens basically it's connected to leaky gut if we want to get into that term which is not really my favorite term it's a little sounds a little crude but um, uh, intestinal hyperpermeability is the clinical term and the the part of the part of the reason I don't like the term also is because our guts are supposed to be leaky because that's where we digest our food that's where the nutrients go into our bloodstream so but the problem is and it happens the problem becomes, um, or it becomes a problem, sorry, when our leak guts become too leaky. And that can happen from, you know, too much even pollution, stress, but basically poor diet is, is a key factor there. So that's eating processed food, have lots of chemicals and hidden sugars and that kind of thing. Um, also alcohol and even caffeine can be very, you know, can be damaging for the gut lining. So we want to make sure that whatever we're consuming is as natural as possible so that we can look after the health of our gut. And um, that's where, you know, I can, I don't sure where you want me to go on this because it's on this huge topic. Usually I describe the, the how this works with a diagram. So um, I'll have to make sure that your listeners are, uh, are following along here. Um, but basically what's happening whenever we eat food, it goes into our mouths, of course. And I will note now that that's where we chew and you make sure you do your food because that's where digestion begins. We want to make sure we are digesting our food appropriately. And then the food once digested or once chewed up into like mush, hopefully it goes down the long tube into this, uh, through this, the soft to the stomach and then into the small intestine. And of course, this is sort of a simplified version of what's going on, but um, it's in the small intestine that the food gets absorbed into the bloodstream. So when we're talking leaky gut, we're talking about it happening in the small intestine. And the small intestine is fascinating because it's anything but small. If you were actually, it's all, it's all folded like an accordion. So if you were to spread it out, depending on the size of the person, it could be anywhere from the size of a badminton court to two tennis courts. It's absolutely a huge surface. So you can see where the opportunity for leakiness can happen. And it's covered with these little things called tight junctions, these little um, finger-like projections. And it's in between these finger-like projections, these tight junctions that, that bacteria or viruses or undigested particles of food can seep into the bloodstream where the bloodstream then launches an attack. And it's this attack that is the, where food tolerances happen. And it doesn't happen after just happens once or whatever. It's well, This is the kind of thing that, you know, after it happens all the time. So when you think, when I think about how I used to eat and how still many people eat with, you know, not very good quality wheat, for example, that has something called gluten in it, which is a very common food sensitivity or food uh, intolerance. And what can happen is gluten is very difficult to digest. And even though we're learning more and more about this, but you know, a lot of us aren't chewing, a lot of us are on the run, a lot of us are, you know, just you're eating processed food, you don't need to chew, it just sort of, you know, falls apart and goes into your stuff. But these undigested particles of food like gluten seep into the bloodstream and the bloodstream or the, the inflammatory cytokines or the sorry the inflammatory the um the immune system the immune cells in the in the bloodstream see these 
undigested particles of gluten or gliadin, and they attack it. And when this happens time and time again, like I was saying, like if you're having toast for a muffin for breakfast and a sandwich for dinner and a couple cookies or in the afternoon and then pasta or something like, like wheat, 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 not very good quality wheat five or six times a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, you can see where that kind of, you know, assault on the system can turn into food sensitivity. So when we just back it up a little bit where we are with our food industry and and how many people and myself included I'm not judging here because I've made every mistake in the book I've fed my kids this awful boxed macaroni and cheese when they were little like I just didn't know they loved it they were happy so I, <laughs> that's what I did um and, you know, we just do things out of sheer you know, desperation. I have five kids, we're going through drive throughs we were just, you know, whatever, just feeding them, you know. Um, but now I know that, um, you know, when we do this, we just, it's almost like this consistent assault on, on, the, on the system. We, we have all this stress, which also affects the, the, the lining of the gut and the poor food and then you know we're you know slowing down at the end of the day with a glass of wine or a beer and we're starting every day with a cup of coffee like right there that's a normal life and we are so this is you know and then not to mention the you know the pollution in the air and that kind of thing and we've gotten so far away from the way our ancestors ate and the way humans were supposed to be eating, like just food from the ground or from animals who ate, you know, naturally, natural plants that grew from the ground and fish from clean water. And we've gotten so far away from that, that uh, that is why we have like, this practical epidemic, I almost hate to use the word like that. <laughs> with what's going on in the world today but it is like so many people you just I'm, I'm sure it's the same in Australia because I've been to Europe and it's the same there you go everywhere and it's gluten-free this gluten-free that it's like what the heck I didn't know of anybody when I was a kid we all eat gluten we all ate wheat um but it's because of what we've done to the food and uh and then you know and then you have to throw in something like glyphosate which um I don't know if they use glyphosate in Australia, it's um, well it depends. Um, we do use it on some things, yes. Yeah. Um, but okay. there's a number of things that have gone through and um, legislation-wise and things like that. That's you know mm. to on the lookout for, trying to be a bit more sustainable, I guess. But yeah, that is a huge, huge issue. I know an individual who um, sprayed it. Um, a, a client of mine who sprayed it without mask, without anything on for a number of years. So I worked with him on his, for the last two years or so, on his nervous system, and it just oh, destroyed it. His liver, his oh. nervous system, but he had no idea. He was just making no. an income for his family. Um, so, mm. yes, I can definitely relate to that. But I love that what I love what you said about the whole, about what's what's normal, What's normal is you wake up, you have a coffee, you you have a muffin or, you know, and some coffee. You At lunch, you have a sandwich um, and then at dinner, you might have some cookies, you said, and then some, you know, some pasta and some forth. And then you end up with gluten and beer, right? So <laughs> you there you have it. You have like, and, and that's not once in a while. That's nearly every day, like you said. So mm -hmm. you see mm -hmm. how these intolerances, they don't just pop up. Oh, hello. You yeah. you kind of make them happen in your body. It's kind of like an you're, you're making it happen. The, the process of what you're putting inside of your body equals these food intolerances. Whereas allergies, like you said, or you know, uh, uh, reactions and things like that, where you need a, a, a plethora pen, they they are they're totally different. It's a totally different kettle yeah. of fish. Looking at two totally different immune system reactions right yeah. there. So I love that you explain that and how the food starts and, and, and chewing. I know everyone says, what do I do for mm. my digestion? Chew, isn't that right? It's, it's so interesting. with so these important. Beautiful teeth that we need to use. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. And we're built, we're built to do it. We're, we're made, we're, we're very complex pieces of machinery the human body and uh we have everything it takes we have the enzymes in our mouth we have the enzymes in our we are the hydrochloric acid in the stomach and enzymes in the in the intestine we are made to be able to digest food appropriately but our bodies don't even really 
we've changed the food so much in the last 50, 60 years that our bodies are probably going like, what the heck is this? They probably don't even, the bodies itself don't even recognize. That's where, you know, checking labels and that kind of thing are, is so important, but even better yet, if your food has a label, you know, just avoid food with labels, like an apple doesn't have a label, you know, that kind of thing, other than maybe if it's organic or not. But, you know, generally speaking, um, you don't really, because I wear glasses and I'm at the grocery store. I don't, you know, if I had to read all the words, if there's that many words on a label, it's just put it back on the shelf, you know, it's, yeah. it's not what you want. It's a lot. But, it's uh, a lot, isn't it? Well, I wanted to mm-hmm. know, the audience might be listening now and being like, okay, okay, fair enough. That is what food you know, intolerance is. I understand that. That's amazing. But how would someone know they may have an intolerance to a certain food? Like what with some sign and symptoms that they may be experiencing? And I know you mentioned some such as saying it's not just gut, it may be mental health, but are there any specific ones that someone may know or how long would they, does it happen straight away? Does it happen after a while? How would they know they may yeah. be intolerant to this food Mm -hmm. it's it is really tricky and it can take a while but now that people are more aware that this is actually a thing um there are some things that we can do so there's some some foods that are more commonly um sent people are more intolerant to and those are like wheat or foods that contain gluten dairy um what's the, the list eggs corn nut seeds um, soya, I think that's basically it. If anybody, you can always email me if you want the complete list, but it's a list of some food of those basic foods. And then sometimes people kind of know too, like if it's chocolate or tomatoes or something, they sometimes know if they like, Oh, you know, I, but it's very, tif- very difficult to know because sometimes you won't get a res- you know, a reaction for a day or two. And just, you know, so it wasn't what you ate last night it was what you ate two nights ago. Um, so what I would recommend people do is uh, food sensitivity, not like, um, not I was going to say food sensitivity test, sorry, I meant um, uh, an elimination diet. When I first started practicing about uh, a dozen years ago or so, we were recommending people do the IgG tests. I'm not sure if they're very popular in Australia, that people are doing them all the time here. And they can be quite overwhelming and not always give a, a true picture to what's going on. Because just because you're developing these antibodies doesn't necessarily mean that you're sensitive to these foods. So we, we believe now the gold standard is to do um, uh, food um, elimination diet. So which basically what that means is you would re- remove the foods that I just listed, the most commonly um, intolerant foods. And then it's a good idea to keep a food log. So food, so you'd log down daily, you know, what you're eating, how you're sleeping, your mood. Um, and and you're, if you're pooping, that's also a, a, good, uh, a good piece of information. And you remove the foods for a couple of weeks. And, you know, it depends on the person again, right? If you're really not feeling well and you really think you're like, oh boy, I really need to get some work done on my gut and that kind of thing. You might want to do it longer than a couple of weeks, but you know, for a lot of people removing all those foods for a couple of weeks and then reintroducing them slowly one at a time, again, keeping a food log and, you know, for some people, and there's some other things that you can be doing at the same time to actually help with the health of the gut that I'll go into in a minute. But for some people, even just removing a food for a couple of weeks, implementing some gut healing, other gut healing strategies, some maybe a couple of supplements and some other healing foods can actually, you know, slow things down a little and cool things like cool off the inflammation, just, you know, get everything, you know, just working a little bit better maybe you can start reintroducing some of these foods. I, for me, it took a long time because I let things get pretty bad before I turned that corner. Um, I used to be intolerant to wheat and any wheat products. And whenever I would eat something like that, oh my goodness, I would just get achy and malaise and just like, it just felt like I needed to lie down. And it's taken a while, but now I can. And in, and it's not always, you know, every once in a while we'll have pizza out or something that it's usually pretty well, it's always well sourced. It's not like fast food pizza, but it's not always organic. It's, you know, but usually 
uh, I would stick to organic or sourdough, that kind of thing, or maybe even a sprouted wheat or something like that. Um, it would, but, and I don't have it every day either. That's the other thing. I'm not having it five, six times a day. Like and I that's the key, to. isn't it? That is definitely part of the picture. Um, but I'm fine and it's, and it's great. And I, because I can't imagine, you know, yes, some people are celiac and can't uh, have that. But I think a lot of people are going without gluten when they don't really have to. And they think that life is great without it. And maybe it is for them, but I wouldn't be happy if I couldn't eat bread for the rest of my or only gluten-free bread. I wouldn't be too happy about that. Um, so, but I'm, I'm really passionate about my food. So I love I'm very that. happy that I can have that. So I guess um, the signs and the symptoms, they're different to every person, like you said. Mm-hmm, like you mm-hmm. just said, you know, you felt like you just wanted to sleep. So someone who might be like, I guess, bloating, a lot of it. Oh, yeah. Flatulence. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or even, yeah, constipation, diarrhea. Yeah, it could be. And that's what makes it so complicated. And that's, but, you know, it's complicated, yes, but when you look at the ho- the aisles of the grocery stores, the sh- shopping stores now, whatever you call them there, um, it's evident that a lot of people believe and have figured out that they shouldn't be eating gluten or feel that they shouldn't be eating gluten because they're, you know, they can get any junk food, anything now, like gluten-free this and gluten-free that. So I think people find, you know, make that realization pretty quickly that they remove gluten and they feel better. But that's not the whole story. And that's really, really important, not just because you're if you're like me, and you don't want to give up bread, (laughs) the rest of your life, that's not the only reason. But there's foods, you know, we want, we want to be eating a wide variety of foods, especially not everybody comes from heritage that they've been eating gluten and wheat there, you know, for for many generations, but I certainly did. And that probably means that there's something in there that my body needs. We need to look at food, not just in the last 50 years, but for the last hundreds of years. Um, My family is from Europe originally, like generations ago, and they were eating a certain way. There's probably something for many generations they ate that way because people didn't move around so much back then. And I'm sure that there are certain things in that food that I'm supposed to be eating. And then we know this now that gluten, and this came out just like a year ago, that actually the microbiome, which is, we haven't even discussed the microbiome and the microbiota. My gosh, there's so much to talk about. Um, but uh, the microbiome, Okay, briefly, um, are these trillions of microbes that live in and on your body. And um, they are a a huge part of our health picture. In fact, uh, we are more microbes than we are cells uh, in our, we have more microbes and cells in our body. It's debatable how, what the ratio is that keeps changing, but anyway, Um, And these microbes are in charge of our hormones, our immune system, our inflammation, our mental health. They are basically part of every aspect of our health. And interestingly, when it comes back to the gluten story, that they discovered about a year ago that our... um, the, the, the microbiome that resides in our large intestine consumes gliadin, consumes gluten as part of its food. And, and should be, it's not, again, <laughs> excuse me, probably not for people who are from parts of the world like Asia and places like that where they haven't typically consumed a lot of of, um, of wheat, but you know, they, they eat other kinds of, of well, anyway, I, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't uh, really comment because I don't know exactly what they've been eating for generations, but typically they're not as attached to wheat as we are yeah. um, and dairy and that kind of foods. But it's, it's just very interesting that that's the, one of the very interesting things about this, uh, the science of nutrition or really any science when it comes down to it is that we don't know very much. There is so much, like as much as anybody knows, there is so much more that we don't know. And so that's why, you know, when we have to, you know, just swing everything back, turn it around and just look again at mother nature and the planet and just think if mother nature made it, it's, you know, it's got to be the way to go. We don't even know 
what really is in a real, like in an apple, for, for example. Yeah, that yes, scientists and have extrapolated specific nutrients and that kind of thing from an apple, but there's so much that we still don't know. And if it was grown without the use of pesticides and having an apple every day, that is medicine. That is yeah. powerful medicine. And um, so basically just you know, trying to, to live in a way that, you know, respect for our bodies, respect for the planet, respect for, uh, respect for nature. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I, I love that you said, you know, there's gluten free everything everywhere. And you know, unless mm -hmm. you're celiac, I mean, you know, for those individuals that are celiac, mm -hmm. you know, they might be like, okay, it's amazing, I can eat that. But that doesn't mean that if you have a gluten free cookie and a normal cookie, that one's better than the other. That depends right. on the <laughs> ingredients. If we get our glasses <laughs> out, if we look at the ingredients, <laughs> what is actually in it? Also, is it organic? If you get one organic and one not organic, one's sprayed with things, one's not, like you got to look so much deeper. It's not just a given as, mm -hmm. okay, it's gluten-free, it's good for me. You know, like here, right. here in Australia we have, which I think is absolutely blows my mind, we have a health aisle. That, yeah. that just blows my mind. We have an aisle, it's <laughs> a healthy aisle, healthy foods. Literally it's a sign that says healthy foods. And I just go and I go, this just blows my mind. So are you saying that all of the other seven <laughs> aisles are not healthy? <laughs> that we have like, you know, a you know, like a quarter of an aisle that's healthy and everything else is unhealthy. That just blows my mind. But anyway, but that just means just because it's in the healthy aisle, that doesn't mean that it's actually good for us. And like you said, let's go back to the one ingredient, two ingredient foods that are the vegetables, that are the fruit and things like that. But what actually blows my mind also is the fact that our food has changed over generations, over mm -hmm. years. So what I wanted to know your input. Why do you think, let's take it, you've been talking about gluten, so let's continue on that one. Why do you think individuals weren't as intolerant to gluten back in the days and now more individuals are intolerant to gluten these days? What would be some key factors? Yeah, well, definitely part of it is, the, the food, the processed food and the amount of chemicals people are ingesting. So it, it really, the key fact is back to the leaky gut. So the key factors are what causes a leaky gut. And that is, you know, the chemicals in the food, too much, you know, processed sugar, so it's processed food, processed sugar. And just to be clear, a processed food, because, you know, some people might think that, you know, I don't know, some noodles or something like, and, you know, and yes, those are processed, but you have to, so there's sort of levels of, of things that are processed. So if you look and the noodles have like one ingredient, well, then that's not as processed than if you can't read or pronounce the ingredients. So this is what you really want to avoid if you can't, you know, if you can't pronounce it, you definitely don't eat it. Um, but then, you know, and stress, stress really is very impactful on the, uh, on the gut lining as is, um, like I said before, alcohol and even caffeine. So, you know, every once in a while you hear, oh, a glass of wine a day is good. Drinking coffee has, you know, uh, uh, antioxidants and, you know, different things. And, you know, that's all true, but, you know, if we're talking, which we are right now, specifically on food intolerances and which is, you know, it's, it's all about the gut. It's all about the, the leakiness of the gut. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting because, you know, someone would sit there and be like, you know, but in the days we used to eat gluten every single day, it's fine. But it's those factors that you <laughs> just mentioned that that goes back to the leaky leakiness of, you know, the leaky gut or intestinal permeability. <laughs> it goes back right. to that. So that's a very interesting point that you've made right there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and there and it's true that people ate bread every day and copious amounts, but it was just different bread. So if they'd been eating, they, you know, how did they how did they make it? It was probably sourdough. So that with sourdough, it's fermented. Gluten is is partially broken down. It's almost like partially digested kind of thing. You can almost think of it that way. Um, and the fight and there's things like phytic acid and that kind of thing that also can be difficult on on uh, on the gut lining once again 
you know, almost non-existent in a sourdough bread compared to a regular uh, bread. But even we know now that even yeast, like bread yeast is good if it's good yeast. It's like, and it's when we get into that whole, the whole topic of it's not the food's fault. Well, it's not the food's fault if it's good food. You know, if it's a junk food, then it might be the food's fault. <laughs> But it's not the food's fault if it's good quality food. And so you ask yourself, you know, did Mother Nature make it or was it formulated in a lab? You know, those kinds of things. Would your great grandmother have recognized it? You know, if it's in a tube, probably not. Right. Like, you know, so it's those kinds of things that we need to start asking ourselves. Um, and that's and that's what our bodies need. It's it sounds so simple and so obvious but i know because i was the, i was one of those moms that was just dashing through every day the kids are hungry and, and you know pull out a box with packages of little things and toss them you know toss them over my shoulder if i had to in the car <laughs> while we were going from dance to hockey to, you know that kind of thing go through the drive through you do what you got to do and um you know no judgment here I get that but there's ways and that's what i teach now i teach basically ways to to, you know, badge cooking and, you know, organizing and, and, and once you go there, and that's the thing, like once you start eating that way, you, you can't go back. You just, you, you, I love food too much to go back. I, I, it just doesn't taste very good once you're used to eating natural foods. It's, um, your taste buds change, like, your, 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 your yeah. receptors, they change. And then if you get something that's really artificial, you're like, oh my gosh, this feels like chemicals. Like, what is this? Yes. Just, I've done that before yeah. and I'm like, I used to eat a lot of these. Let's try it. And I'm like, ooh, what is this? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because they put chemicals in them to enhance the flavors and it sort of it gets you right back here. Like, oh, it's, yeah. And I can, it's, um, you get sensitive, like your brain overreacts and I'm just like, ooh, what's yes. this? I haven't had this feeling before. The normal food that I yes. eat or the usual food that I eat doesn't do this to my brain. <laughs> Right. And, and and that's such a, a big part of it that we don't even realize. Thanks for mentioning that, because it's it's when our brains are reacting like that, these are stressors, right? And stress causes leaky gut. So when you think these chemicals that we're eating and what it does to the brain, and if you, you know, if your brain's not functioning that well, if you've got foggy brain and you, you know, you're just anxious, or I should say just, but if you're anxious or not, you know, depressed or whatever, however you're feeling, that's very stressful. So one thing just sort of leads to another. And then those things often lead to more caffeine and alcohol at the end of the day. And, you know, like, just one thing leads to another. So it's a matter of, you know, meeting people where they're at. It's not, you know, it took me a long time to start, you know, to eat the way, even though I went from like zero to a hundred in a way, I didn't stay eating like that. Um, but, you know, to meet people where they're at and just start shifting and start with the foods that they actually like to eat. Like, like I work with lots of moms and I, you know, teach them or show them how to make chicken nuggets and, you know, those kinds of like, like their favorite kind of sandwich that they would get at one of the fast food places at McDonald's. Whatever. How do you make that at home? You can actually make that at home and you batch cook it, you batch prepare it. So it's ready to go in the freezer, or, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. I and, love that. Um, so one thing you've said just there, the key thing is, is you're no longer doing that, right? And this is what brings mm -hmm. me to restrictive diets for a short term mm -hmm. and a long term. So a lot of individuals, right. like there's a lot of diets like FODMAP diet and, you know, other diets, mm -hmm. um, like you said, pulling back everything, removing everything and then putting it back in. Some people forget that putting it back in part and they just stay restricted right. because they're feeling good. I mean, imagine an individual, the audience that's listening right now, imagine, you know, you're, 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 you've got this diarrhea, you've got the bloating you've got the brain fog you don't have the energy and all of a sudden you've removed this food and you're feeling amazing i mean of course you would want to stay on that restricted diet because you are feeling absolutely amazing but my question to you is 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 how long should someone i guess it depends on the individual but what, what is you know short-term and long-term restrictive diet what impact does that have on us well, long term is really not a good idea. And we just have to, once again, think about how, you know, our family history and what our, you know, what our, you know, our heritage, what we have been eating for generations or whatever. And like I said before, too, that like, 
we know now that gluten or gliadin, which is a difficult to digest protein in, in gluten, actually helps to feed our microbiome. And if your microbiome has been eating that for generations, sure, you're going to feel better when you first remove it. But a few years later, and I know many people who have been off gluten for years because they didn't go to the next step because we can, you know, I'm only a nutritionist, I'm not a doctor, so I shouldn't be using words like healing and that kind of thing, but we can help to improve the integrity of the gut line, let's put it that way. It doesn't always have to be hyper permeable. And so, you know, removing the food and doing the food, um, the food log and the, 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 um, sorry, <laughs> um, it's getting on in the day for me, the uh, elimination diet. Um, so the elimination diet is only step one of, of sort of this protocol. So there's other things that we can do. And that's what most people don't realize. They remove the food. Now they're eating the fast food gluten-free and they're, you know, happy and that kind of thing. But over time, it's going to come back to bite them and they won't know why. And it's going to be, cause it just gets, health just gets more complicated. <laughs> As you age, especially if you continue to eat, you know, processed foods and that kind of thing. There's five steps to um, to this protocol, and the first one is the elimination diet. But and you don't necessarily have to do you know one and then you know wait and do the other. You can sort of do them somewhat simultaneously, especially if you're doing them with food. So the first one is is the um, the elimination diet, and then adding something like enzymes, it can be a, can be helpful. These are digestive enzymes, so it's you know you don't necessarily. Some people take them all the time. <laughs> you don't necessarily have to be taking them all the time, but when 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 you're in a position of transition, it can just sort of ease things up and get things going while you're learning how to chew better and eating a little slower and putting your fork down so you're not gobbling up all your food and sitting and relaxing and all those things that help your body's natural digestion. You can try some uh, digestive enzymes. And I will say, I don't go around recommending supplements just on the internet. Uh, you please work with a qualified healthcare practitioner and, you know, because everybody, you know, people are vacation and you know anyway so but this is just my the basic protocol and then um and then there's gut, uh, gut healing uh, there's gut healing supplements and foods and the supplements would be like glutamine or like slippery elm marshmallow you um root you can get these in formulations and and so you you know this helps with the mucose lining that i was talking about like so first it's like the the microbiome then the mucosal lining and then under that is the finger like projections and this is where you know the the leakiness can occur so you want to make sure you have a nice thick mucosal lining so you want these mucilaginous foods um and that could be like flax or chia or okra uh, bone broth has glutamine in it. Uh, so there's, you know, actually you can do a, a lot of this just, you know, with chewing and food and that kind of thing. And then, um, and then also within this whole gut healing protocol, what I often recommend are antimicrobials because um, back to the, the microbiota, the bacteria for a moment, what often happens or it's hard to know what comes first the chicken or the egg but when a person has leaky gut they usually have dysbiosis dysbiosis is an imbalance of this gut gut microbiota that i was talking about. these microbes these billions of microbes and a lot of us end up having too many bad bacteria and not enough good and so when you use a back an antimicrobial you're sort of killing off some of the bad letting the good flourish and so so that can be a really good idea as well. And those, again, they can come in formulas and again, work with a qualified healthcare practitioner um, when you're trying these things out because it, they can, you can feel pretty awful if you don't know what you're doing. Or even if you, when you are working with somebody and you're really not well, this, you can get uh, feeling worse before you get feeling better if you're not really careful and go really slow. Um, but there's, again, there's foods that have antimicrobials, like you're using spices like oregano and um, uh, so many thyme and, and uh, rosemary, so many of these you know, using real, so instead of buying the, the packaged food with the little packet of flavor kind of thing, just buy some, even dried, it could be dried, preferably organic um, herbs or fresh, if, 
um, if you can get them and just start tossing them into your food. They're delicious. People will be blown away with your cooking and um, you can always get great recipes for this kind of thing on the internet. So, you know, again, antimicrobials can be food, but obviously in a real gut healing protocol, you would use um, supplements and then fermented foods. So that's when we're adding more of the bacteria back in and you can do that with food. Um, most cultures, I don't know about Australia, but most cultures have fermented sort of built in culturally. Uh, we don't so much here in North America. People eat yogurt and it usually has artificial flavors and tons of sugar in it. Um, but, uh, but yogurt's great. Yogurt, again, yogurt's great if it's good yogurt. So you want, you know, full fat um, and organic, plain without sugar and you add your, you know, some yummy stuff to it, some berries and some honey or maple syrup or something sweet yeah. like that if you like that and you know delicious away you go um but they have for, because they have bacteria it has live bacteria so when it's important to consume these li live bacteria every day if you can because we know now that when you are consuming these bacteria they don't take up residents they are transient they last 24 48 hours how they actually know that i'm not sure but that's what they say um but they don't stick around they come in but they'll come in and they act as a good barrier in the gut and you know protecting you know to make sure things don't get too leaky and uh, so very important and so again i you know that's the five steps I wouldn't necessarily dive in and do them all at the same time, work with somebody that will gradually bring you through the process. And, you know, everybody's different, like you said, like, but I did it and I had a very leaky gut. Mm. <laughs> and I love and that. I love the five steps that you've provided us with. And I mean, I'm actually currently doing that at the moment. It's quite oh, interesting. Great going through that i try to do it depends once a year or so because i'm mm -hmm, just maintenance mm -hmm. i did do a major one yeah. when things were happening but now i do once a year maintenance both of the gut okay. and liver at different stages which i think Excellent. is key 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 for anyone everyone yes. should do maintenance yeah gut and liver little resets um yeah. depending on you know the seasons also and things like that what's happening in their yes. life but the thing is is I'm not going to say it's beautiful. It's not beautiful. <laughs> it's definitely um, feel it. Like, you know, you feel more fatigued. Mm -hmm. You feel a bit more like tired. Your body just wants to rest. But you can understand, if you understand what's happening inside, you can understand why you're feeling the way you're feeling. And that's key right. what you said, that you need to work with someone because they understand what you're going through and they can lead you through it and guide you through it and maybe even stop at some stages and go, look, you're not ready right. at the moment to go through it. Exactly. Yeah, because it's yeah. too much. Yeah, and that's when it's like, yeah. that's when you're working with a good practitioner that actually says, "Hold up, let's just hold up for mm -hmm. a week, get you running to your back to life, and then start again." You know, and mm -hmm. it, and it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Those five steps. I mean, it, it sounds simple with what you just said, but that will give you the, the, the gut, the gut lining. It will just make it so much better. It will make it smoother. So then you can enjoy hopefully those foods, and it, you know, it goes back to it's not the food's fault. We go back to repairing right. our gut. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And I do that too. I, I, I cleanse three times a year and I don't always do the, the whole gut thing. Yeah. But yeah, liver is definitely, uh, definitely usually on the, on the list <clears throat> of things that I'm focusing. And for me, sometimes I focus on adrenals and that kind of thing. Yep. And then the rest of the time, I'm, you know, I just eat really delicious, almost everything and don't focus on it all the time because it's nice when you do it that way and you can do it that way that um you're not you know i've met people in new, like nutrition school and that kind of thing that try to eat perfectly 100 percent of the time and you know they aren't always happy people so <laughs> it's nice to sort of you know we don't want to be overly uptight about these things either and that's the nice thing about you know doing your what you know if you call it a cleansing or a gut repair protocol or whatever you call it doing it you know I, I do it uh, once a month three times a year but you know I was on medications I had you know I had I was on thyroid medications and three heart medications I was really not well at all and i medication free and I'm in my 60s now and I'm healthier wow. now than I was in my 30s and 40s and uh, so it's 
you know, it can happen when so many people around me are like, oh, well, you know, we're getting to that age. And, yeah. you know, this is downhill from here. It's like, not for me. I had my downhill. <laughs> <laughs> it's uphill for me for now, isn't it? It's interesting yeah. when you look back and you go, wow, I feel so much better than I did 10 years ago. And that's not mm -hmm. what's supposed to happen with aging. That's not what's supposed to happen. That's not what we're told. We're told the older we get, the worse things will get, you know. And, and then that kind of goes back in line with what you said. Yes, it will get worse if you keep eating those foods every single day that are aggravating and making your gut permeable and things like that. Yes, you will get worse. But, you right. know, if you follow the things that you've mentioned, those practical tips, then we may not be able to get worse. We may actually be better. Right, right. We can turn that corner. It's not always easy. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's necessarily easy. And, yes, you know, it actually costs more money usually for most people organic food locally sourced food that kind of thing costs more money buying a few supplements but heck you know people it's yeah and you can't put a price on your health in, in yeah. my mind and um yeah so That's it's great and, and so what would you say days. what would you say would be some practical tips i know you've given us the whole protocol which is absolutely <laughs> amazing is there any like maybe that's the first one is there any other like two other ones to make a three that would just kind of help and assist individuals you've mentioned a few throughout the show but are you able to sum mm. it up in regards to some practical tips the audience can take away okay well where i usually you know when people ask me oh, look, is there one thing that you would recommend to everybody and that's the thing right like no so no matter who you are whatever age you are no matter what current your current health situation i recommend and I, i'm afraid i'm trying to repeat myself but it's to eat natural whole foods what that means is food that's not in a box or, or it's, if it's in a package it only has one or two ingredients make sure you're not eating chemicals you know do your best to you know to do a little research and, you know, find out if you can access, um, you know, locally or uh, ethically sourced meat and dairy and eggs. And um, yes, they are more expensive. Like a, a, here in Canada, you know, a dozen eggs is like six dollars. But that's still like an egg is like a superfood. An egg is a, is a beautiful food. It has so many, it helps with your memory and it helps with, you know, the protein is um, muscle building, which, you know, like it's, it's just so good for you um, that, you know, it's like, it's same, it costs less than a chocolate bar kind of thing, but people will only want the, the 99 cent or $2 eggs, even though an egg, a good quality egg costs less than a chocolate bar. Yeah. So you just have to really think about, you know, how we're spending money. And, and, and also the, one of the things I used to do is I used to give to heart and stroke foundation. I used to give to Greenpeace and I used to, you know, annually. And now I give to the farmers. Wow. With my food. Like, I don't mean I literally go over, but like where I buy my food and yeah, I'll go to the, sometimes it's the health aisle, in the yeah. grocery store and sometimes, but it's, you know, it's you more often, you know, that little health food shops or the, the uh, markets in the summer and, and that kind of thing. And, or, you know, order food in, um, I get my meat from a, a farmer. I get my dairy from a farmer. You know, you, you have to do it does, these kind of things. Just don't happen overnight. You start with where you're at, and if it means going to the health aisle or just picking up an organic apple instead of a not organic apple, just think of it not just for yourself and for your own health, but think of it for the health of the planet and you know for your children and grandchildren and so on so you know that just makes it a little bit easier and it did for me and how i spent my spend my money yeah because where your money goes it talks, doesn't it it does it really does you know you can write letters to you know your the government and that kind of thing and complain about you know pollution and these which you should you know sure if you want to do that that's that's fantastic but you can also do it and you know do have the same kind of impact by, um, you know, in your kitchen and where you spend your money.
Yeah, a hundred percent. Wow. I love those. I love those practical tips. And I guess, you know, it depends like where you're at is where you start. Um, but mm-hmm. absolutely the, the information you provided um, is absolutely amazing throughout today. So I guess the audience will now understand, you know, why they may be intolerant to some foods, what signs and symptoms they may have if they are intolerant. And then I guess a little bit of a protocol in a sense to work with a health professional, what it looks like to heal that gut. So then it's it's not the food's fault. And I love that, you know, you, you summarized everything so well and you know, they're able to understand what's happening inside of their body. So to finish off, I ask all my guests, as this is the Natural Health Podcast, what is your best kept natural health hack that you may do every day, that you may do once a week, but it's something that keeps you healthy? Okay. Well, this one may sound a little out of left field, but this just popped into my head. Um, I oil pull. And I'm sure you've probably heard of that. So, and a lot of people haven't heard of it. And I've heard even more recently people complaining that it takes long, but I have a quick tip on how to do it and why to do it. So first of all, call it oil pulling. It's an, it's an Ayurvedic, which is an old Indian uh, medicine um Uh, traditional medicine technique to actually help to uh, remove bacteria from your body, not just from your mouth, but it's really good for your teeth. And it's good, you know, whatever, you know, is good for removing bacteria in your body is, you know, in a healthy way is a good thing. And uh, I use coconut oil. Coconut oil has cuprylic acid in it, which helps with um, candida or uh, overgrowth of fungi. So, which was an issue of mine. So that's what I use. You can use any oil that you feel you could handle in your mouth start with a tiny little bit. I use probably a heaping teaspoon now, but uh, I used to use a lot less. Um, And I keep it in my washroom and I take some and then I hop in the shower in the morning with it in my mouth. And then you make sure you spit it into the toilet or into the toilet. Not to actually try this probably not the same, but not down the sink because it can clog your 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 pipes um, or put it in the tissue and into the into the garbage and make you rinse your mouth. And yeah, it's something I do it like almost every single day. And my my hygienist wonders like, what are you doing? And, you know, (laughs) that kind of thing. And um, it's not it's not probably one of those things that's going to necessarily change your life. I now that I'm thinking, I probably could have given you something better. But sorry, I wasn't prepared for that. I, I think I think that actually but, can change individuals' life because when you think about it, that is where it all starts. That's where our digestion yes. starts in our mouth. We choose. We started there. If the bad bacteria is already in our mouth, it's gonna go into our gut. So I think that is absolutely brilliant. I do it. I try to do it every single day, exactly like you in the shower. Oh, excellent. excellent. So I think that is an absolutely amazing health hack because we underestimate those little things that we do every mm-hmm. day, like like the oil pulling. How much can actually assist with even today's topic. <laughs> That's right. Well, and actually there is there in the good bacteria in your mouth, it, that's where the uh, digestion of gluten starts. There you go. So oil is oil a, a new piece of information for me. Like we're always learning. Like if you're looking for a healthcare practitioner, make sure you find one that, you know, it doesn't matter when they graduated, that they they're still learning because there's yes. new information coming out all the time. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Thank you so, so much for today's information and You're your knowledge. If people are interested to find out a little bit more, I know you said you've got something to offer and you're available where on social media would be able to touch base with you. I'll put it in the show notes, but if you can just let us know. Uh, I have a free offer. Actually, I have a couple, but one of them that's quite popular is my 10 favorite brain boosting recipes. I am a specialist in mental health. So that's kind of a fun one. Uh, That's free. And I also on my website have a a little mental wellness starter kit. And I'm pretty sure that I've got the oil pulling in there. And uh, but I have lots of products. I have a little shop on my when I say products, they're programs. I have a little shop on my website at Glenda Britton, www.glendabritton.com forward slash shop. And uh, actually I'm promoting right now a few mm-hmm. mental health programs, little mental health programs that are on promotion right now. So if you don't delay, you may be able to take advantage of saving a little money there. So Absolutely amazing. And I had a look at them. 
your website's amazing. Had a look at them. They're there. They're available. They're well-priced and individuals are able to access it, So, which is absolutely amazing. Yeah. And I'll put that in the show notes below so they right. can access to get in touch with you if they need more information, mm-hmm. if they want to work mm-hmm. with you. But thank you, thank you so much for joining us on the Natural Health Podcast and I appreciate your knowledge and the information that you shared with us today. Well, thank you very much, Mahela. It's you're nice most, talking to you. You're most welcome. Thank you for joining us on the Natural Health Podcast. And remember, the missing link between failure and success is your health. <laughs>